and that's not fair on either side. No, absolutely. And one of the things that we talk about in this episode is the questions that you should ask yourself when you're considering or if you're considering getting back together with someone. And one of them is exactly what you said, which is what has changed. All right, everyone, welcome back. I'm honored to be joined by Allie and Rourke from Finding Mr. Height podcast. How are you today? Hey, Dave. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. Rourke, how are you? Um, I'm doing well, too. We're having like a spat of beautiful weather in LA and I've gone to the beach two days in a row. I'm living the life out here. I am I am not as great having heard that. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> my day just took a dive. Ali, you're in New York. I think you said Brooklyn before we hit record and what's yeah. life like in uh, in New York City right now? You know, I, I love New York. I've lived in New York for 12 years. I think it's magical. Um, everyone who says New York is dead, don't come back. <laughs> that's that's how I do. Yeah. That's a very New York thing to say, Ali. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we say the same in Denver is like it's not as good as you've heard. Like this is not the <laughs> promised land because uh we're full. Like, don't come to Denver. We're full enough. And like before shelter in place and the pandemic, traffic was awful. But now it's like driving around town, it's almost like uh it was 30 years ago when I first moved here. Yeah, the, the outdoor dining situation, which I think has always been a thing in other more temperate climates, has just changed the game in New York. And it's like it was always meant to be that way. And I they are actually approved it for it to always be that way. And I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how so? Describe that for me a little bit. So all of the restaurants, and I think this is true in a lot of cities, but all of the restaurants have created these outdoor extensions of their brand in the street. And as you're, and there's all these streets that are now pedestrian only that didn't used to be. And it just feels like a community when you're walking down the sidewalk, like you're walking through these restaurants. Uh, that's so cool. I, I think that's a fantastic idea of making certain streets pedestrian only there in New York city. Yeah. People actually are picnicking or they were last summer. They were picnicking in the middle of streets. It was so cool. <laughs> If it's nice enough outside, I'm on board. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. So I love New York. Mm -hmm. It's my happy place. Yeah. How do you two know each other living across the country? So Rourke used to live here. We actually used to work together many moons ago, right out of college. I'm, I'm from the Bay Area, and I think I always knew I wanted to come back to California. And so when I decided to apply to graduate school, I looked out here, and I felt that LA would be something different it wouldn't feel like a return home, but it would still be the stuff about California that I love. Mm -hmm. I find both San Francisco and New York City both just extremely romantic and destinations that are on my list. I love Sausalito. I love San Francisco. My folks lived in Sacramento for about five years, so I got the chance to visit and they took us to the great places in San Fran, San Francisco. You nice. guys either call it SF or San Francisco. Yeah, it's right? not, not, San Fran. not San Fran. Yeah, it's yeah. Not. <laughs> I'm from San Diego, so I, ha I have the California in me as well, but haven't lived there in a while. That is an amazing town. I'm not even going to tell you what happened on the bachelor party that 16 of us went to San Diego. You don't need to tell me. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> lived it. <laughs> We didn't get into that much trouble. We did go to a Padres game and we we tried to get ourselves kicked out of the Westin and uh, so you forth. You know, you, just, so you tried to get yourself kicked out, but you failed. You didn't get kicked out. Yeah, we couldn't find one of those um, lime scooters, bird scooters that had a charge on a Friday night and we were going to drive it through the lobby of the Westin Hotel. <laughs> like we're in our late 30s and these guys <laughs> and I want to like pretend like we're 15 again. I, my friends and I were in Austin a couple years ago and we were going around and we were like calling ourselves the like scoop gang like who are we we're 30 years old <laughs> when somebody falls off of the scooter we're dead we're not surviving percent <laughs> they're such an attractive nuisance we want to like do everything we didn't do as kids on those things you know they're fun though so Allie how did you know that you wanted to be uh, a dating coach there in New York City well so interestingly it's this is not my full-time job so I actually am, I'm in corporate retail. I've been in corporate retail my entire career, um, but I also studied consumer psychology in college as sort of a corollary to my interest in retail. And I've always been really interested in human behavior in general. And I've also been single a lot in New York City and on the apps. I beta tested Bumble 
like I've been online dating for a very long time. I met my first mm-hmm. boyfriend on a website called E Crush when I was in high school. E Crush, haven't heard of that one. Oh yeah, high school. You said one. Yeah, this was. I'm. So, this is like 2002. Um, sure, it doesn't exist anymore. I probably, probably. <laughs> but I. So I've always had this interest and also, you know, personal investment. And I started blogging about my own dating life, and realized that my stories were really resonating with people. And it sort of organically happened that people started asking me for advice. And then I thought, well, I should start doing some actual research. And I just started kind of pivoting. And Mm -hmm. now I have this side hustle that is quickly becoming a passion. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, Finding Mr. Height. And I I think I've heard you say you're six feet tall. Is that where the name comes from? I am. Yeah. So I actually had my followers pick that name. So I I posted a like a poll, like a questions box on my Instagram. It's a long time ago now. And I asked for suggestions and then I picked my favorite four and then they voted and that's what it was. Awesome. I love it. It's so funny. That's where I initially found you is Instagram through many, many ways that the social media can connect us. But how do you yeah. uh, rope Rourke into being your co-host? I got very lucky in roping Rourke into my, into being my co-host, but um, she and I have always just had in Rourke, like you could speak to it too, but she and I have always just had this very good back and forth where we agree sort of philosophically about a lot of these things, but we have very different experiences and nuances to what we think. And I think that, I don't know, just spoke to us as making a good fit. I don't know, Rourke, what do you think? Yeah, I think certainly that's true about our general approaches. I think logistically I roped you into a podcast. (laughs) Um, I have, I just sort of like Chinese water tortured her um, about it for a while. And, you know, I think what was, what sort of came out was she was like, Rourke, I am doing so much. I don't have the bandwidth. And I was like, okay, I will take that on. And so um, I think that she obviously has this incredible creative engine and I said you know I'll I'll learn the editing I'll learn the publishing and we'll kind of figure it out together and um it's it's also really nice because we're both so type a we have a workflow (laughs) excel you know it's it's just a really easy friendship and working relationship there are there are index match formulas in our working document (laughs) That's hilarious. And I would not, ex- I would not expect anything different for an eight and a three on the Enneagram. And thank you so very much, Allie, for taking the time to complete that test. I'm also a challenger. And as soon as like you sent over your results, I'm like, of course she was an eight, because when you're filling out the questionnaire, you're like, really, is this a question of like, when I ask how important authenticity is in the dating world? You're like, seriously, Dave, is this a question that you even Do you have already to know? Did you already know when I, I knew. filled that out? <laughs> I knew it. And also the question of like, um, like you're challenging me every step of the way. And uh, why I bring that up is like, we had a hard time scheduling through my calendar, right? And this kind of parallels like a work life and a dating life. Cause like for an eight and a three, when things don't go very smoothly on planning a first date, kind of bring up some frustration. Same thing as like, I can't get into your calendar professionally, but when you can't get into somebody's calendar personally, either for an eight and a three, that really just like revs us up, doesn't it? It really does work. And I've actually had this conversation because she and I will both get very triggered by that, but then we have opposite reactions to it because I have a very anxious attachment style. So uh, when, when I'm having a hard time with that, I get, I get very anxious mm-hmm. and it like makes me want to like figure it out. Mm-hmm. And Rourke, I'll, I'll let you talk about your. Yeah. I, I actually was talking to my therapist about this and she laughed, but agreed that I definitely have secure attachment, but am avoidant rising. <laughs> and, um, And so Uh, when I'm sort of like unhealthy, I lean into avoidant behaviors. And so for me, if, if a guy's having trouble scheduling with me, I don't bend to make it right. I'm like, okay, bye. uh Yeah. Yeah, It seems like you don't don't have time for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As the, yeah, I gotta wash my hair. uh, I'm very busy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if he doesn't fit in on the to-do list, right then you can't really make space for him. Yeah, I, to- I totally get that for sure. 
so uh, Ali, when you said that anxious attachment style plus the challenger personality type, you've got to figure it out when things aren't going smoothly. I relate to that yeah. so much because um, I actually have fearful avoidant, but I lean towards avoidant rising. I love that, by the way, Rourke, like <laughs> secure you. with avoidant rising because we're making a play on on uh, astrology as well, which I'm not very familiar with. I'm a cancer I and an eight. So you have a crab shell on both of those traits there. <laughs> I am like, I'm like stubborn with a side of stubborn. I'm an Aries, which I don't know that much about astrology that much in general, but everything that I've ever, every, <laughs> oftentimes when I post a video on TikTok, I will get comments saying straight Aries energy <laughs> and like people don't even know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm a Sagittarius and everything I've read about, I disagree with where um, mm. I've actually, I've had my full chart done and every other like rising house of the moon, I, I don't know, I'm making these terms up, are all Capricorn, <laughs> which feels a lot more relatable because those people mm -hmm. like routine, they're very grounded. Like, I don't, I don't actually like travel. Travel really stresses me out. Um, I don't like to go places where I don't speak the language and don't know the laws. I call it mm -hmm. getting Amanda Knoxed. It is my greatest fear. <laughs> but um, so yeah, like I, I don't relate to Sagittarius energy, but somebody who knows it better might. Mm -hmm. saying that I do I don't know mm -hmm. it's interesting that you said that you don't like going places where you don't where you don't know the laws because I've never thought about that about myself but I hate that I get very uncomfortable if I don't understand how I'm supposed to behave now mind yes. you I might not behave in that way because I think it's dumb but I want to know that I'm supposed to <laughs> does that make any sense yeah you know the guardrails are there and it is your choice about whether or not you jump over them right right mm-hmm yeah, for a challenger, it's all about control and it comes down first, self-control. Okay, how do I behave in this situation? And if other people aren't behaving, I'm going to step up and tell people how to behave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if I think the, the way that we're supposed to behave is dumb, then why would I do it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, to jump back to an Enneagram challenger, the eight plus an anxious attachment style, I can relate because like when I'm not at my best, and I am feeling my anxiety come up, I go more towards like the investigator, the five, which is like, I got to know, I got to know the truth. I got to find out mm -hmm. the truth so that I don't get hurt. And that's my self-preservation behavior. Does that, does that resonate for you? I don't know if I do that. I feel like I, I don't even know. I think maybe a little bit, I think for me, it more like I get this pit in my stomach, like I just know it's going wrong. And I like, I have to fix it. But I also, I don't know if it's quite investigating. I don't know. I think mm -hmm. I need to do more digging into the Enneagram to like, see where I go. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite things to talk about besides attachment theory and besides combining all of those, all of those principles into our dating and relationship lives too. So how do you, uh, Allie, how do you see your anxious attachment show up? I very much, and I have worked, I've also in therapy and worked a lot harder to be mostly secure, but I, so maybe I'm secure anxious rising, but I'm probably still <laughs> mostly anxious. A sun but, or a moon or something yeah, like that in there. Yeah. Yeah. But I really see it show up in the communication that I need. I really need a consistent communication with somebody and if I don't have that, I get very anxious about what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, relatable. Rourke, does that, does that land with you? Um, how do you support her as a securely attached person with avoidant rising? <laughs> I think I got that right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that we both, you know, I, of course, can have anxieties too. I, this morning, texted Allie and I was like, am I being ghosted? <laughs> and the answer was no. But The answer um, was no. Yeah, the answer is no, but, um, and so, you know, I, I think the ways that we can be there for each other is to say, um, you know, I received a text from Allie the other day that said like, I'm in a text my ex mood, what do I do? And I said, anything you're thinking about texting him just sent to me, I don't care what it says. And mm -hmm. so, you know, just sort of being there for each other to kind of reality test. Cause I think just having a, you just want to hear that you're not crazy. Um, from a third party. And so I think, I think a friend can just always provide that instead of feeding what you're feeling. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think we also have this like 
understanding between us of what the other person is looking for too, because I think that's really important that I have some friends where I know if I text them something that they will immediately jump down my throat or they will project their own advice or thoughts onto it in a way that I do not want them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And Ali, I love how when I reach out for something, you'll often say, I don't mean to be directive, but don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, no, direction is what I need, please. <laughs> yeah, give me, give me an example. I, I'm so curious to learn more. I had, um, I had a date with somebody where um, they wanted to sort of shift the plan around. And it was because a work call came up late and it was very much out of their control and my avoidant response was to say this sounds like it's gotten complicated we can just cancel the date and that's not what he was saying at all he was saying can we just start an hour later than we thought and that's when Allie was like do not do that he wants to go out with you like <laughs> what are you doing yeah it sounds to me like the relationship the two of you had coming from like an attachment theory lens is a secure one so you both feel safe enough to communicate like these vulnerable moments in your lives. And then you go to each other with really a clear lens of understanding that, Hey, we've earned some security here and yeah. we can apply attachment theory to friendships and work relationships and romantic ones all alike. Oh, absolutely. I actually think that my attachment theory is born out of unstable friendships in childhood. So like a lot of people say that your attachment theory is completely driven by your parents and how you were raised. And I do not think that's true for me. I do think it's true that it's driven by childhood, but I don't think it's always driven by your parents. And mm -hmm. for me, I had a childhood, specifically a middle school into high school experience where I did not feel safe in my friendships. And I think that that drives a lot of my current attachment issues. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call them issues stuff. Yeah. Was it a, was it a challenge of like setting boundaries with those friendships that you were raised with middle school and high school? Yeah, I think it was. So I went to the same school from kindergarten through 12th grade. So obviously you change a lot in that time, but it was a very small school and I didn't really feel like I had as much space to grow in my friendships with people because everybody had known each other since we were five. Mm -hmm. And so I went through some shit in middle school. I don't know. Can I curse on this podcast? Yeah, go right yeah, ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> great. great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so I went through some shit in middle school. Like I dealt with a lying issue for a while. Like I was just, you know, being a 13 year old idiot. And I felt like some of my friendships couldn't come back from that. And I didn't have any other options because I went to this very small school. And so even though I had worked through a lot of these things that I went through in middle school, I didn't, I didn't feel safe with my friends anymore. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. Some of them are going to be listening to this. I love you. If we still speak, then you're not part of this group. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if we still speak, you're not, you're not who I'm referring to. All right. Yeah. Good disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think that that drives a lot of my anxiety is because of of not feeling safe in those friendships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, Rourke, uh, so you, you're you leaning more towards secure. How do you see that showing up in, um, you mentioned, hey, am I getting ghosted? How does the secure attachment show up for you? For me, I think um, I'm an only child also. And so, and I have a lovely relationship with my parents. Like I, I'm very, I'm very, very fortunate in sort of the family life regard. And so for me, a lot of it is I require a fair amount of independence and I actually don't love to text with somebody all the time when we're dating. I like to have sort of our week to recap when we reconnect and spend time together in person. And so I dated somebody probably 18 months ago who I think he was anxious and it sort of activated my avoidant where he could not respect my alone time. And he would view it as a personal insult that I was not where he would spend like Friday and Saturday night at my house. And then it was a negotiation about like when he would leave on Sunday. Are, are, and are you my ex-boyfriend talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're interchangeable like 
anyone avoidant resonates with that so much and anyone anxious is like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Look how red I am right now. Like, like that, that's me. <laughs> Sorry, we're so funny. Going. No, it's fine. Um, no, it's important to hear the other side of it. And um, and so I I feel like I feel a lot of like safety in space. And I think that my goal, like my dream relationship is to feel secure in that when we're not speaking, we're still like committed and safe, but we don't have to be like literally checking in all the time and it's okay to have our own activities. And for me to do something with my friends one night or you to do something with your friends one night. And that's not an, it's not a reflection of me not wanting to spend time with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds like a dream for me as well. Um, my current partnership's about seven months in and we have very clear boundaries and very clear expectations. We, we sat down when we were officially getting together about six weeks in and said, Hey, let's create this relationship agreement that we have. I tend towards avoidant and she tends towards anxious, but what our goal was in co-creating this was to develop this sec earn security in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And when it comes up for us, we'll actually label it. Hey, I feel my avoidant tendencies come up when this occurs in our relationship. And she'll be uh, free to say the same thing of like, I feel my ang anxiety show up here. I just need to let you know so that in the next couple of days, I need this from you. I love that. And that's actually something that I tried to implement unsuccessfully with the ex-boyfriend that I'm referring to, who by the time this podcast airs, are the episode where I talk about him will have aired. Um, but the one we just recorded and that story that you told Rourke, which I've actually never heard before about the weekends thing really resonates with me because it was actually a long distance relationship. And so I would, and it, but it was in Philly. So I would take a bus, bus schedules are flexible. He had a very hard time if I flexed my bus to a later time, like it, was not mm -hmm. okay if I didn't leave at the at the 9 a.m. bus and I tried on Sunday morning you're saying or right yeah to, like at, to come home to New York okay exactly like at the end of the weekend like it, he would have a a very hard time if I like one time I missed my bus I took 50 buses I missed one we spoke about it often <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's so he was avoidant and that 9 a.m. bus was was like the cutoff time of this has been fun. This has been great. This is my max capacity mm -hmm. of emotional bandwidth for the weekend. Right. And I tried to have conversations with him about, you know, I think you might have some avoidant tendencies. I know that I am anxiously attached. Can we have conversations about that? And it was just a hard no. Mm -hmm. When I was a child, and we can certainly psychoanalyze this, <laughs> I don't know what it says about me that my dream that I envisioned for my married life when I was a child was that we would be fabulously wealthy living in New York City with adjacent townhouses where we <laughs> middle sometimes to hang out <laughs> but we would sleep separately <laughs> wow yeah I, I don't see that as a bad thing like um <laughs> speaking of New York City I'll, I'll watch how I met your mother every now and then and yeah. when they get the twin beds that's what this sounds like is like, oh, we'll, we'll slide them together to be intimate and then we'll slide mm -hmm. them apart. Oh no, no. Like your body heat is too much. I you sleep have your own hot. space over there. Yeah. And it's I'm not, <laughs> I'm not opposed to the idea of having two homes here in Denver with a bridge that crosses between the two properties. Yeah. That sounds terrible to me. <laughs> Like, because that can... doesn't feel safe for you, right? No, Ellie? that feels mm. that feels very unstable. <laughs> and it's certainly not like we want to develop a roommate situation with a long-term intimate partner. That's certainly not what we're what we're alluding to. It, it's just really paints a a clear picture of what the attachment theory and attachment styles lens would speak to from the avoidance side. In listening to your podcast last week, what was it titled? The corresponding one. The it was corresponding about pen pals. one, mm, pen pals. And what came up for me when I was listening to it and it really hit home for me is like, there was a guy you were chatting with, Ali. I think you were telling the story and he wasn't taking the lead when you mm -hmm. gave him clear signs that you wanted to go out with him. 
Did that happen to you both? I, I think if I hear, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Well, I think both of us have actually probably run into that scenario multiple times, countless times over the course of our dating uh, careers, if you will. Oh yeah. It's an incredibly common experience. And I'm, you know, I, I I'm of course going to commit the sin of making up a statistic here where, you know, the odds I believe of you and a match actually meeting up are quite low. And I think this is just one of the many reasons, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It, th this is a dating app people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going, we're trying to go on a date and trying to go on a date. Yeah. I, I thought that that was really clear when I signed up, but I guess that, um, it comes back to communication being the key to everything. Um, yeah. I recall, oh gosh, uh, I, I had spent three years being single before this current partnership. So I'm a lot like you. I have a, a lot of miles under my belt when it comes to dating online and organically. But I matched with this person on like a Thursday or a Friday. I noticed that she was from out of town. And I said, hey, what brings you to the app? Because I noticed you're, out of you're from out of town. What's your favorite thing about Colorado was my general opener. It works, you know. Oh, I'm just in town for the weekend. Oh, okay. Well, I'm looking for something long-term and not long distance because I that would be perfect for an avoidant. But I just knew that that wasn't the right fit for me at the time. So I made that clear. And she's like, well, wouldn't you just be okay with being friends and we can chat? And I said, well, I'm clearly on a dating app. I'm setting a boundary here. Thank you, but no, thank you. That's not the right fit for me. I'm not looking for any more friends. I've got a, I've got a really good friend group as it is. We've talked about that before where, and I, I like to say no new friends, but I like, I don't actually mean that. Like I, I like new friends, but I don't need to use a dating app to find them. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I have no interest in that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I respect that finding friends as an adult can be hard. I have a friend who moved to LA right before COVID. And he's, he was saying, I I'm not sure how to find friends right now. And so I I'm very empathetic to the idea that somebody might use that as a hack, like a life hack, <laughs> but it, it conflicts with where it's a problem is you saying what you're looking for and need and that person sort of railroading it. That's, that's the issue. Mm-hmm. And then certainly when she heads back home, all we're left with is a pen pal or like another right. social media connection. Exactly. And mm -hmm. like we said on the podcast before, I don't need to check in with a stranger about how my day is going. Like I just, uh. I just don't need that. And I don't care how a stranger's day is going at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you guys brought that up because it's so common as an interaction of like, hey, I want to stay top of mind in this person's world so that I can eventually get a date. But what you were sharing as a story is you're both sending very clear messages and you're looking for a, a kind of a masculine energy to take the lead. And when they don't choose to step up and do that, it kind of leaves you hanging and frustrated is what I was hearing. Yeah. And I think it's not even, I don't generally like to say masculine energy, feminine energy as much, because I think that while I agree with it in this specific context, it there's a slippery slope where it like very quickly gets kind of problematic, but specifically in my TikTok comments. Um, oh, I got you. I, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> but, but I think that there is something to the sense, to the fact that both of us are planners. Like I, in a, in a partnership, in a friendship, in my friend group, I am the person often that is going to be making the plans and doing the investigation and all of that stuff. I need somebody who can also do that. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, I have found that if I take the lead from the beginning, I never find out if that person can meet me halfway. Love that. Rourke, is that, is that your same experience? Yeah, this is something that Allie and I definitely have in common. And, you know, my friends will say, it'd be fun to go to Palm Springs for a weekend. And I'll, I say like, okay, here's a costed out chart of um, the weekends we could do in six different Airbnbs. And, and mm -hmm. um, they very much, they're very lovely and grateful for sort of like my role in the friend group. And I, I do need my, my partner can do 35%, you know, that's fine because I do get pleasure out of 
this aspect of my personality. I, I like to be in control of these things, frankly. And so I don't, I don't mind that they don't even meet me 50, 50, but it, it does need to be, it, there needs to be the ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, taking initiative is really important because it, it makes it very clear, no mixed signals whatsoever. If, if the person you're chatting with takes initiative and right. it shows interest like to a really, really flattering level. Absolutely. And I think one of the words that Rourke used from her friends, the word let's is possibly <laughs> my least favorite word on the planet because it's like, are you, are you asking me to do this thing? What do you mean let's? It's, it's like the most unclear word you could possibly use. And I see it so often in my own dating app conversations and also in clients when they're showing me back and forths with someone where they're like, oh yeah, let's do this. Or we should, we should is up there too. Yeah. It's, it's hard to bring a should into a, a good co- sense of communication. Right. Like, yeah, I know we should go out on a <laughs> date soon. We, we met on a dating app. Yeah. Let's do th- it's almost like passing the ball back into somebody else's court and giving somebody else the leadership opportunity. And I can understand how that wouldn't really be all that attractive. Yeah. And it's, I also think that it's, especially in this particular scenario that we played through on the podcast, I actually told him I am free on this day. Like let's go on a date. And he did absolutely nothing with it. And mm-hmm. said, do you want to plan something for next week? Which does he literally mean? Do you literally mean, do I want to plan something? Because the answer is no. I, I, listened to, I listened to the interaction on, on your podcast episode. I, you playfully bantered back and forth. And like, you're so right that do I want to plan? No, I, I want to be shown that you're interested. So let's step up or step out. Yeah. And- one of the things that I have found in relationships where I have done the planning up front and never found out if that person could do it is that I have ended up feeling, and I think said this on the podcast, I've ended up feeling like their summer camp director where our entire relationship, everything we do is completely and totally controlled by me, which mm-hmm. also, by the way, means that I'm responsible for when it doesn't go well. Is, is there a scenario where that's happened? Oh, yeah. In my... <laughs> In my most recent relationship, so not the avoidant one that I mentioned, but my most recent one, we started dating right before COVID. He actually moved to another state without telling me during quarantine. It's a whole other story. He moved to Connecticut, didn't tell me he was doing that. So we were in a long distance relationship, surprise. Without a necessarily being agreed upon. (laughs) Right. Like we met in New York. We both lived in New York. He still had a lease in New York, but he decided to permanently move home to his parents' house in Connecticut and did not tell me. So anyway, so he then was visiting me every time we saw each other in New York, even though that's also where he lived. And he would get very upset if I didn't have our days planned out with enough activity like he was bored he said that once he's like this is boring I'm bored like okay what would you like to do I so yeah so then it was my fault that I had not properly programmed the day I I can't imagine what that's like yeah that's yeah that's his perception does not mean reality. Though. Correct. Yeah. He, in mm. his mind and the way mm. that he, and I don't actually know if he thought it was my fault, but he was certainly treating me like he thought it was my fault. It's certainly not fair to come up with a story on your own and put all of that responsibility on another person. Right. I can't even imagine how frustrating that would be. Very, very frustrating. Mm-hmm. And how did you go about um, setting a boundary or making yourself feel heard in that moment? I, I don't think I did that good of a job, honestly, like looking back on it. I think he also was somebody who was very accustomed to just constant arguments in, in relationships. And I've never been in that type of situation and he was used to it. So he would trigger them because he thought that was like a normal thing that couples argue and they yell. And I, so I didn't really handle that very well because I, 
because it's terrible. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound like a very safe environment. And the story I'm creating for myself over here is that sounds like a trauma bond kind of a situation or like kind of a toxic scenario to be in. Yeah, definitely. And it actually started out in a way that I very much cautioned my clients about in a very like love bomby trauma mm -hmm. bond kind of way. Mm -hmm. He said, I love you to me within two weeks. Okay. Which at the time I was like, oh my God, this feels so fast, but also isn't it romantic? No, it's not romantic. He doesn't know you. This is a stranger. Essentially a stranger for sure. Work, have you ever been love bomb? Yeah, certainly. Um, I will say a little bit, I'm a little skewed on love bombing because my parents got engaged after six days and they've <gasps> been married for 36 years. I didn't know that. And so I like, there is a part of me that like thinks that's very possible. And that is, but I do believe my parents are absolutely the exception, not the rule. And so I have to sort of separate that out sometimes, but I am I'm very uncomfortable with compliments. I, I, it's the, I don't have low self-esteem. That's not the problem here. I'm not super comfortable with compliments when a person doesn't know me. Mm. I like to, and this probably actually goes to Enneagram three. I like to earn my compliments mm -hmm. by like mm -hmm. showing you something. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody is just like spewing all the stuff they really like about me, I'm like, I haven't shown you that yet. And it, it makes me, it makes me just not trust it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I can totally see that. Um, I dated a three for a little while and, uh, you know, like five, five weeks in five dates in or something like that. I was an infrequent dater. Like I would date once a week to get to know somebody and that's my avoidant tendency showing up, but it was very comfortable for me with a busy, busy schedule, just like yourselves and five dates in, uh, we're doing ramen and Netflix night at her place. And, uh, I think it might've been the first compliment I gave her, maybe the second, but I was like, you know, one of the things I respect about you most is how passionate you are about your work. And that's a good I, compliment for an Enneagram three. I think yeah, like, I would be like, that's... love it. <laughs> and, and what's your, to your point, if like those compliments come too easily and too freely, it's really hard to trust, you know? And, uh, one of our, one of our former guests just got married. Like, Kayla is one of the best people I know. She's an amazing wedding photographer and she just celebrated her, her wedding this past week. She had a client that she photographed their wedding. They were engaged after 11 hours. Their first date was a marathon date, 11 hours long, got engaged at the end of it with a ring and they're still married with beautiful children 15 years later. So the exception to the rule. I, I think that the reason and this we talked about this in the episode that's coming up um, that will be live by the time this goes. But I think that my parents' story is the reason why I think that I can romantically get back together with an ex and it'll work out because yeah, my parents met when they were 19 and then broke up after college for a while and then got back together. And then they were married for 35 years. My dad passed away, but until oh, then, sorry to hear that. thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, so like, but I've never really thought about that, that that actually might be one of the reasons why I am much more open to that situation than most might be. Right. Yeah, that's understandable. So what's coming up for me is like, I do feel as if exes can take a break and then come back together. I think that's completely viable and, and totally plausible. Um, if the circumstances of like why they broke up was actually worked on in that interim. Does that make it, sense? Yeah. You're, you're anticipating you're... the podcast. <laughs> oh, really? Like literally like one of the things that, so we talk about what you should, because one of the things that we're very clear about in that episode is that we can't tell you whether you should get back together with your ex. Oh, I don't know. Work doesn't know. But what we talk about are the questions that you should, Dave knows. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I go, I go through my list of exes. I'm like, would I get back? Nope. <laughs> would I get would I get back with that? Nope. Mm -mm. And like, I don't talk about this much on the podcast. It's not like I'm airing out all of everything that I can disclose. And I really respect how you both approach your personal shares as well, while respecting their privacy, but also giving enough context to make it valuable for the listener. I really do respect that a lot. Oh. And where I come from is like, 
I hadn't yet shared how many exes reached out after the beginning of Shelter in Place last year. Oh, wow. And what came up for me and why I want to speak to it today is like, when I receive that message, it gives me the opportunity to either respond or react to that person. Viktor Frankl is like, in the moment between stimulus and, re- and response is your opportunity for growth. Hmm. And it was a great lesson for me to learn, okay, a person I dated before reaches out, hey, as much as I would like to get together, um, these are my boundaries. I'm not comfortable seeing you during COVID or I'm seeing somebody new, thanks for reaching out. Or you know what? I don't know why it is that you still think of our relationship. Yeah. So it gave me an opportunity for growth. This person is probably going through a lot of stuff right now. And I don't have the answers coming from a dating coach perspective or being in a relationship with you before. I don't know why you still think of us. I just don't know the answer there. And at this time, as much as I appreciate hearing from you, I'm not really interested in working through that with you to find out the reason. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds very hard, very healthy, and also kind. Like you're still being kind to that person because I also think though they think that you can help them through it, you truly can't. And you're actually probably being kinder to them by setting that boundary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if if I'm just going to show up as half of myself because I know that there's not an authentic reason for me to communicate, then I'm holding them back for what's meant for them. Mm-hmm. And that's not fair on either side. No, absolutely. And one of the things that we talk about in this episode is the questions that you should ask yourself when you're considering or if you're considering getting back together with someone. And one of them is exactly what you said, which is what has changed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, no one reached back out to me. Um, I, <laughs> I, you guys just set really steamrolled. clear, definitive boundaries at, at the end of relationships. Is that... Okay, that's, that's a pattern of mine. All right, I understand now. Rourke, um, I interrupted you though. I'm oh sorry. No, <laughs> Nobody fine. reached out you're to gonna, you. <laughs> you're going to laugh at the episode when you hear about the boundaries that each of us have individually set at the end of things, but go yeah, on, Yeah, <laughs> mine, mine are a little intense. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so not only, you know, we, we also talked about in the podcast is almost a threshold question is what you were just saying, which is, why do I want to even start this conversation with this person? Why do I want to either reply to their overture or why do I want to initiate one myself? Is it because, you know, this was a person who treated me well and I felt safe with, and I'm very lonely right now in COVID. And like, let me just see what happens here. That's probably not a good enough reason. And I think if, you know, we talk about sort of the idea of unfinished business. We talk about logistical reasons for breaking up that might've been resolved. Maybe you were in different places and didn't have a timeline to be in the same location, but now you are, you know, who knows? And so this, that gets into the context specificness of it, but I think you do want to be very, very clear with yourself on those types of questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that work. Um, That's really valuable to me in this, in this scenario. When I started to go out and look for helpful ways for me to communicate better, because I saw it as a pattern coming up for me of like, the way I'm communicating is not as authentic as I want it to be. So like, if we could give a takeaway for people, what to say in response to an ex reaching out. There's a lot of anxiety often that goes into directly communicating. And I think that this comes up for everyone, but I think especially women that I work with, have a lot of anxiety surrounding being direct be, or assertive because they've been told that that means they're aggressive and that they're not allowed to be direct and that they need mm-hmm. to people please. Um, and this is true for everybody, but it's really hard to set a boundary that you th- know the other person doesn't want you to set. And yeah, so well mm-hmm. the reason that I think scripts are so helpful is because it takes one little piece of it out of the equation for you. And that is how am I going to say this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as I reflect back on, um, in my current partnership, we use Imago, th- Imago language and we use nonviolent communication uh, techniques. That's, that's also part of our relationship agreement of like, this is how we want to communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. And when I reflect back on any type of conflict that we've had in our relationship so far, I never remember the things that she said to me, making me feel 
less comfortable or uncomfortable at all or defensive because we've chosen a certain type of language to approach conflict. So we're using scripts in the moment because we need support our nervous system. Our nervous system needs assistance in those moments. And if we have the language in a, in a healthier way, well then hell yeah, I'm going to use a script every day, <laughs> all the time. I love that. I've certainly, you know, Ali and I have workshopped some together. I've used some on my own. Um, I, I, I do think it's just that it's that perfect sort of little bit that can give you the courage to really say what you want. Um, I've been, I've been reading a lot recently about, um, like perpetual problems and how like most relationship problems are perpetual problems. Mm -hmm. And so the way to approach difficulty is by sort of like validating the other person's where they're coming from and just sort of like figuring out how to like meet each other somewhere because it's not like we're not going to become other people and um so i do i i love thinking in those terms i love thinking about like the dbt like two things can be true at once where um you say to somebody like you know ali getting back to our um if he's aware, capable, and wants to, he will. It's somebody can be trying their best and still need to do better. You know, two things can Mm -hmm. be true. And so having those sort of frameworks in mind just do make communication easier. And there's nothing wrong with educating yourself about those things to sort of shortcut some of these more difficult moments. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I I hear you describing dialectic behavior therapy or training. And a lot of the Gottman's work is around that perpetual perpetual yeah. problems. Too. I am so obsessed with the Gottman's. They're fantastic uh, researchers and their blogs are just so easily digestible. And uh, we're using their lasting app in our relationship now where we can communicate oh. when we're not together. So I, I highly recommend an anxious and avoidant partnership using a tool like that to communicate when you're not together about hey, when this happens in our relationship, I feel this. And then later on in the week, when you get back together in person, uh, you can follow up on that language. And hey, I want to learn more about why this feels that way for you. That's awesome, Mark. And I think I the Gottman newsletter is like one of the only subscription emails that I read on a consistent basis. It's incredible. I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, but And something that I've been realizing through doing more of this research and reading is that I really need somebody who's open to this kind of work because not everybody is. True that. And it's really hard to find that person through 140 characters on Bumble and five messages back and forth before that you find out that they're just not going to take the lead. (laughs) Yeah. Like my ex-boyfriend, my most recent one used to say like, you have too many emotions and I just don't want to talk about them this often. Wow. Not the person for you. No, what I'm hearing. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say on a positive opposite note, I actually just had a conversation with the, I'm seeing somebody new ish and we were having sort of a talk about feelings. And he said to me, he was like, I hope you realize that like, if you're going to date me, this is what it's like. Like I talk about my feelings and I'm like, great, no problem. Seriously though. Mm -hmm. Well, I I know your time's valuable and I just cannot thank you enough for coming to, to have an open and honest, fun conversation with me today. So what do you say we circle back and see where you're at in the next six months and, uh, keep our conversation going. I would love that. This was great. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks Dave. This was so fun. Yeah. Thanks Allie and Rourke. And if our listeners want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So our podcast is called Finding Mr. Height, the podcast. Um, the website is findingmrheight.com slash podcast. And then we use the Finding Mr. Height social media handles to post clips. So at Finding Mr. Height on Instagram and TikTok. All right. Thank you so very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.